always continue in bringing us some acquaintance with the wisdom tradition of our heritage. The wisdom tradition that's informed by both the Old Testament in the Hebrew uh, tradition and also in the New Testament tradition as well. How the wisdom tradition invites us to look beyond the surface to something more uh, profound or mysterious that's being communicated to us about what we need to know about the nature of God, what we need to understand about our invitation into relationship with God. More than a surface level reading of any of our stories. So, we know if what we're being given is within the vision condition, to set it first in a historical context so we can understand what symbols are being evoked that would have been very well known to those who were writing it <laughs> and those who were hearing it in that context that we may not know. So, in the time that Mark is writing, so, by the way, Mark is our oldest gospel. It's not the first in order in our New Testament, but it is the first in terms of being the oldest. Probably written sometime between 60 up until the late first century. So that kind of time period, and during that time period is when, as he's writing, the Hebrew people have kind of done a resurgence and they're being hugely oppressed again. This is the time of the temple period that's being demolished again by the Romans and retribution for this uprising. So another huge experience of oppression, very active and militant going on for the Hebrew people. So Mark is writing, and he's writing this story that he has to tell us about Jesus is putting Jesus into traveling into enemy territory. Because the people of the territory he's talking about were fighting on the Roman side against the Hebrews and suppressing them in their rebellion. So this Syrophoenician woman that Mark is writing about is an enemy to the people to whom Mark is writing. An enemy comes into the door seeking this healing moment. Now, in the time of Jesus, the story that Mark is telling, and in a setting in which Jesus, as we remember, comes from a tradition that was very high on purity code. In the codes of Leviticus, it's really all about being righteous, includes keeping the letter of the law and all these purity codes being clean and not being exposed to anything or anybody that is considered unclean. Unclean things could include anybody <laughs> who wasn't uh, prescribed Hebrew also keeping ritually pure. And here's this woman to whom he's not related, and she belongs to a Gentile group, someone outside the Hebrew nation. So she's representing the foreigner, the unclean, someone who's not of the people. Now, it's interesting that the territory that he goes into of Tyre, or Tyre, he's not into this place that is predominantly Gentile territory. It's foreign territory. Why is he gone there? We get this sense from the story that for whatever reason he's left the place where people know him. <laughs> Maybe it's the political pressure. Maybe it's the overwhelming number of people who are constantly on him all the time. But he's gone to escape. And the way Mark shares the story, Jesus is trying to get away, get a break. Have you ever had that in your life? Just give me 30 freaking seconds of not being bothered to just get a break. We get that sense that that's where Jesus is spiritually and emotionally, perhaps, in his ministry. He's gone out of his own country and away from his people. He's even taken advantage of the desert hospitality, the Mediterranean hospitality that was the rule of the day and still is in many places in the Mediterranean area, which is the accommodation and welcome of strangers into the home. He's gone into someone's home. And probably it sounds like someone he doesn't know, but who's taken him in to lodge as he's journeying into their land. So they've taken him as a stranger. He 
he is trying to get some quiet time. The trying to go where no one knows him, and here's this woman who's heard about him. She represents the impure, she's a Gentile, and the way Mark sets it, she's an enemy to the people to whom Mark is writing. So this least desirable person, no matter how you measure it, bothers him when he least wants it. <coughs> how do you think that's going to go? <laughs> and we hear that. Basically, his whole little ending sentence to her talks about children and dogs. And we're to understand that the children that he has come to feed, come to heal, come to be a part of, is his own people. Thank you very much. It is the Hebrew people. Most people who come, we come to know as reformers, are not really about trying to do anything outside of their people. If anything, they're trying to transform their own culture, trying to transform their own belief system. Martin Luther initially had absolutely no thought that he was going to become something other than Catholic. He was really looking to reform Catholicism initially. That wasn't going to happen. <laughs> but we have here Jesus basically saying, I've come for my people, and you're not it. And he calls her a dog. He calls her and her daughter dogs. Now when we go back into the initial Greek, it's even more. It's He's calling her little dog, puppies. You guys are a bunch of puppies. So there's also a connotation of being spiritually and religiously immature. Not only is she undesirable like a dog, she's spiritually immature. You can't get too much more insulting. He's not in a good space, we would say, in having this encounter. Now, it's interesting because she accepts what she's being called. You notice how she doesn't get haughty, she doesn't get all in his face and talk back to him and defend herself and say, who do you think you are? She says, okay, I'm a dog. But even the dogs serve. And she treats him with respect in return for what she's getting. Even the dogs serve. Get to eat the crumbs left from the children, the chosen. So he makes up that. Now here's a guy who has just been spending his entire ministry trying to get that point across to his own people. You know, all, all pure and holier than that we all think you are? By keeping the law? By doing it that way, you're not keeping the law of God, which is love your neighbor. If anything, Jesus is preaching and teaching to his own people is, stop that. Stop making this demarcation between who's above and who's below. Who gets more God and who gets less? Because God is here for everyone. God is here for everyone. Why is that so hard to get? And he's so frustrated that that's not getting across. He goes to enemy territory, foreign territory, to get away from his frustration. Here comes a woman who gets it. And basically says his own message back to him. And he says, because you just preached the word to me, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> I, 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 and in fact, he goes through his own transformation. Up until that point, he has been preaching and teaching exclusively to his own. But then the next story, in the same reading we just heard, he goes even deeper into foreign territory, Gentile territory, and forcefully heals a deaf mute man in that territory. Jesus himself is stretched to go to new places in his heart and in his thinking. That is to be our model, says Mark. To be stretched, to go to uncomfortable places, to be challenged to live into the very message that we would preach to others, which is the message of love. It isn't enough, says our scripture readings, to just say, love one another. <laughs> we have to do that <laughs> through actions that do what Jesus was doing. It's interesting in the first half of our reading then, that the very moment her girl is healed from a demon is the moment when Jesus stops demonizing her. 
The moment we stop trying to demarcate who's less than us, who's not worthy of what we are worthy of, the moment we stop demonizing, isn't it interesting how good they suddenly become? <laughs> <laughs> how less evil they are. In the second half of that story, the hit of the deaf mute man, it takes going into those new places and spaces of the heart, the geography of the spirit in our journey, to find people who need us to hear them. It is only by the action of saying, I'm going to be quiet now and invite your voice. I want to hear your voice. And in that amazing opening up, we help people who have not had a voice to speak to us just by quieting ourselves and setting ourselves aside. Our preferences, our favoritisms, this is the way things should be. And setting aside and saying, tell me about your experience. Who are you? And suddenly when your voice is free and our ears are opened, we are doing the work of love. And so our journey, let us journey to new places in the geography of the heart, encountering people we might think are foreign enemies, weird, however we phrase